Please welcome Robin Weissman, Coin Center, Alan Lane, Silvergate Bank, Ted Rogers, Zappo, and Pratin Vallabanini, Arnold and Porter. Hi. Um, I'm Robin Wiseman, and I'm Senior Policy Counsel at Coin Center. Um, for those of you who don't know us, um, Coin Center is an independent, nonprofit research and advocacy organization located in Washington, D.C. And we're focused on the public policy issues affecting cryptocurrency technologies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, we spend our time doing three things. The first is educating policymakers and the media about te this technology through plain language backgrounders, primers, indiv individual meetings with policymakers, and big events like this one. The second is developing public policy research that helps fill the gaps where technology has outpaced the law. And lastly, we advocate for public policy choices that keep cryptocurrency networks free and open for innovation. Today, we are lucky to have a great panel who can help us to better understand some of the issues behind the important question that we hear so often at Coin Center, and I'm sure a lot of you ask in, yourselves in this room. Why is it so difficult for Bitcoin companies to get a bank account? So, as we often do at Coin Center, as part of our public policy research, we said, that's a really good question. Let's find out why. So today, Coin Center is releasing a report entitled Overcoming Obstacles to Banking Virtual, Business Virtual Currency Businesses. It's authored by Pratt, together with David Favre and Andrew Shipp of Arnold and Porter. Pratt is an attorney in the Washington, D.C. office of Arnold and Porter, and he maintains a comprehensive corporate regulatory and enforcement practice that serves the needs of financial institutions, their directors and officers and investors, and counterparties. Fun fact about Pratt is that he has lived in 10 states. Following Pratt's presentation, we will be joined for reactions and questions by Alan and Ted. Alan Lane joined Silvergate Bank in December of 2008 and is its Chief Executive Officer and is a Director of the bank and its, and its holding company, Silvergate Capital Corporation. Alan has over 30 years of corporate and financial institution leadership experience. But more important than all of that experience, something you should know about Alan, is that he has 17 grandchildren. Ted Rogers served as president of Zappo, a global Bitcoin platform. He has worked in the financial services industry for nearly 20 years. And while he might not have 17 grandchildren, and I'm not sure how many states he's lived in, um, Ted spent two years as a reserve linebacker for the Washington Redskins, including during their championship season of 1991 and 1992. And it is my understanding that it, that is the last championship season that the Redskins had. So, um, with that, I will turn it over to Pratt, but I should also mention that we welcome questions from the audience, so I invite you all to visit slido.com and use the event code hashtag consensus, and time permitting, we will get to as many of your questions as we can. Thank you. So, the great thing about, I think, the virtual currency industry and the blockchain industry more generally is you come to conferences like this and you talk to people and they get really excited about their technology and the different thoughts they have about use cases. And midway through the conversation, you ask them, so, you know, if I may ask, you know, who's your bank? Where do you bank? And the conversation becomes very awkward and very silent very quickly. And that's because it's actually, surprisingly, a pretty tricky and difficult question. Virtual currency companies have, uh, it, it, part of industry lore, a lot of difficulty getting access to the banking system, which may be ironic considering one of their premises is to offer an alternative payment rail. Um, but it was that premise that we wanted to explore further and really get a sense of whether this is, in fact, a pernicious issue across the industry and what, if anything, we could actually do about it by way of recommendations both to the industry as well as to banks and to regulators and so thus we commissioned the paper. So what I want to talk about quickly while we have just a little bit of time is a methodology that we went through for the paper, um, some of the core recommendations we found, but then really to offer some recommendations.
recommendations to the industry, to banks, and uh, you know, as gracefully as we can to some of the regulators um, so we can come to a solution for this problem. So just by way of background very quickly, the methodology we employed for this report was to start with the thesis or the hypothesis really that there's a rich ecosystem that populates virtual currency, the virtual currency business, and there must be a different risk perspective across the, you know, that ecosystem with respect to the way banks view virtual currency companies. And so we divided the industry up into uh, wallets, exchanges, payment processing firms, specialty providers, mining and blockchain companies, uh, and went about an interview process of speaking with the founders, CFOs, chief compliance officers, general counsels, of each of those companies, asking them questions like, who, who do you bank with? What was the process like? What were the frictions? What were the successes? Why, and, you know, why, why do you think those successes or frictions occurred? We then interviewed banks, generally between the uh, sub one billion to all the way to the 50 billion range, and asked them formal questions such as, you know, what's your onboarding process like? How do you view the industry? Do you differentiate across the ecosystem? And more informally, some of the larger, really the largest banks in the country, you know, around the two trillion asset size. Uh, needless to say, some, some banks were obviously hesitant to talk about their risk structure, so some of those conversations with the larger banks were on a more informal basis. Um, so that was the methodology uh, that we went about, and once we gathered that analysis, we sort of inputted our own sort of perspectives and experience being banking and regulatory sort of uh, lawyers and service providers and try to make sense and come to some recommendations. So the findings, so I'll just cut to the chase. The main finding was that with very few exceptions, uh, the virtual currency industry and blockchain uh, uh, industry have significant trouble accessing the banking system, both in the first instance to get in, as well as maintaining their relationships while they're in the industry. Uh, and so you might ask, it's sort of ironic that these companies have difficulty accessing the banking system because they are they do exist in many instances to offer an alternative payment rail. But everything from basic operation accounts to handle payroll, to taking ACH, to cashing checks and so forth, banks are necessary. And then if you think about some of the more complex strategic partnerships these companies <laughs> need, doing cross-border payments, remittances, FX uh, or holding custody in the background, even if they're not client facing, usually there's always a bank involved in the infrastructure of providing the provision of services. And so banks are essential to operating a company, whether you're a virtual currency company or otherwise, quite frankly. So wh what is one of the main findings we found? We found that banks, either by choice or by chance, really don't discriminate that intelligently across the ecosystem of virtual currency currencies. Whether you're a blockchain company, a wallet, or an exchange, essentially you are bucketed from many banks' perspective as a very high-risk customer, and they will apply the most rigorous due diligence, uh, enhanced due diligence standards for you, uh, and if they don't, if they even bank you, and many banks we found have a complete industry-wide ban against what they call so-called Bitcoin companies, and so it's a very, very difficult uh, issue for banks. We spoke primarily with, bank, uh, with virtual currency companies in the United States, but their platforms are global, and we noticed a similar pattern in, in Europe uh, and the UK, although there was mixed results. Um, there's a, certain banks in, in, in Europe seem to be a little bit more enterprising and, and open their services up to, uh, to the industry out there a little bit more. Um, what I would say from the bank's perspective, when we spoke with them, they obviously are under a lot of pressures to get their diligence right. And they have, uh, particularly with respect to the Bank Secrecy Act and anti-money laundering regimes, a responsibility to due diligence on their customers. And for customers they view as high risk, they have to do enhanced due diligence. This is particularly an acute sort of sensitivity for them after 9-11. And after the financial crisis, compliance in general is a particularly uh, important issue. So. Uh, we we viewed very little discrimination across the, e e the ecosystem in a negative way because all, all companies are essentially given the heavy hand um, if they're given access to banking uh, at all. Essentially what we have is a situation in which virtual currency companies are indirectly regulated by the regulators through the nexus of banks. Um, and banks are in a difficult position as well because um, this is a continuation of a theme we've seen in other industries as well. It's not just virtual 
individual currency businesses, but money services businesses more generally, and more recently with initiatives such as Operation Choke Point, for those of you familiar, the Department of Justice going after certain companies uh, indirectly through banks that, while maybe perhaps perfectly legal, are politically you know, less than desirable. And so really what we have is a form of indirect regulation of the industry via access to the banking system. So with that sort of laid as a framework, we look through sort of the situation. And in our paper, we outline a few recommendations that we think will help serve as solutions to this problem. We can't run through them all now, but I want to highlight just a couple of, I think, the most important ones. Um, I think you, you probably hear this conference and, and just generally that compliance is very important. But what I would say, rather than just saying, emphasizing <laughs> compliance being important, which it is, I would say, when you approach a bank if you're a virtual currency business, you should have a very good sense of how you're regulated and what kind of structure and framework you fit into. So whether that is you need a license or you don't need a license, you should have a very firm answer to that because banks will ask and they will ask you why in fact is that the case. And, and what we've noticed is a lot of companies will be dealing with these issues and they'll find themselves in a gray situation in which the answer is not always clear and so they kick the can down the road and especially when they don't have direct regulation or any regulator coming after them, they figure that's an acceptable posture. But when you have indirect regulation and are getting left out of the banking system, you know, that's that's a situation you have to address, uh, you know, head on. Um, I would also say that if you're a startup or even a mature company, you may have a situation in which you just have one or two bank accounts and it leaves you in a pretty precarious situation. So if you are thinking about starting in, in this business, you know, factor in a lead time of six months to 12 months to set up a bank account. It takes a very long time. It's very rigorous. Be prepared to open up your business in terms of your tax records, your structuring, because banks will do a deep dive into your business. Uh, and that's true if you're a mature business that's opening up a new line of business, such as expanding into the wallet space or taking custody or becoming an exchange. Um, and I would also say proactive engagement with the regulators is important because even though you may not be directly regulated, if they're exerting pressure on the bank, Banks, you know, they're going to continue to exert it without having a great understanding of what you do. So by teaching regulators about what you do, they will exert less pressure on the banks or do so in a more intelligent, more discriminating way, uh, which is only to, you know, the industry's benefit. I would say, though, to the banks, it, it's a surprisingly small number of banks across the country actually bank in any significant number of uh, virtual currency businesses. And, you know, it, it seems to us that with the influx of capital, this is, it's still right that there's a first mover advantage for the few banks that are enterprising enough to uh, get into the space. It seems like there's a lot of market share here and, you know, we would implore banks to invest the time, learn about the ecosystem, figure out which businesses have an acceptable risk profile and, and to bank them. But more importantly, uh, there's an interesting juxtaposition that we've noticed that many banks, including those at this conference, are investing a lot of time through innovation labs and through, through various investments investments in blockchain, in particular, and Bitcoin more broadly. Yet those very banks are very resistant to providing access through the banking system to uh, these companies. And so you have an interesting juxtaposition. And there is, of course, a different risk-return relationship between equity sort of exposure through innovation labs to this technology versus offering a bank account. But that's something that we would employ banks to use their internal learning and resources to the benefit of, of the industry. Uh, and last I would say to regulators, there is, uh, you know, we've heard oftentimes from the industry that tone is an issue, that there, there, the sort of the lack of clarity and the lack of a pronouncement from regulators causes the industry to freeze. And so banks are a little un unclear about whether they should be banking this and, and they're not getting great guidance from the industry. So coupled with the industry's own push to have a robust public policy debate, so, you know, we would implore the regulators to offer more clarity, to engage the industry more uh, and maybe uh, initiatives like in the UK like Project Sandbox and, and things like that for those who are familiar would be something we can import to the US. So I guess in conclusion just for the paper before we get into the, the, the broader panel discussion I would say that you know despite the influx
influx of capital, there's a significant issue for the industry, uh, a very real issue that you know can threaten the very existence of virtual currency businesses. And while there's no one actor that's to blame, the industry, banks, and the regulators, they all have a role to play in coming to a solution in a way that banks the industry in a safe and sound way consistent with law and regulations. Thanks. Thank you very much for that and for all their hard work on the paper. So I think the first thing we should do, what I'm, in, I'm interested in hearing, is reaction. So reaction from Alan and Ted on Pratt's paper. So that you're going to get real-time grading. <laughs> so Alan, what are your thoughts? Sure. So we had an opportunity to see a draft of the research paper about a week ago. And the first thing that I did after I read the report was I went to our compliance folks and, and asked them whether or not they had participated in, in this research because, quite frankly, I, I, thought it was, I, I thought it was very well done and fairly accurate in its portrayal of the types of things that we as a bank look for when we are looking to bank a, a virtual currency company. And to touch on just a couple things quickly that, that Pratt mentioned, and, um, you know, we, we're required to take a risk-based approach to any business that we're looking at. And so when Pratt talked about the fact that a lot of banks can't make a distinction between whether, the, you know, whether a company is a blockchain or they're Bitcoin focusing on a wallet or, 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 or they're providing exchange services, et cetera, those are all things that we have to dig into to understand the business. But it's no different than any other business that we're trying to bank that, that we're trying to dig into, into to, un to understand the business. So from our perspective, it's just trying to first understand the business, uh, understand the risk that's inherent in the business, and then is it safe for us to bank? And we do that in conjunction with dialogue with our regulators. And when we first started down this path in 2013, I would say that a lot of the companies that we were talking to back then had not yet figured this out either. And, and so we were figuring it out together. So some of the first companies that we banked were, um, you know, they came to us not really knowing what they needed to do. It was, the industry was new, so we also were trying to figure it out. So we figured it out together. As we've, as the industry has matured a little bit and as we've evolved, I would say that today, if someone approaches us and they really don't know what kind of licensing they need, um, that's you know, kind of a basic foundational question. And so what I would say first and foremost is get a copy of this paper, get a copy of the research paper and read it. It's not that long. It's it's very well done, and uh, you know if you're deep in the industry, you can probably skip the first couple of pages that talk about you know, that's kind of industry foundation stuff, and just dig into uh, what the banking requirements are. Because I, like I said, Pat, I thought it was very well done. Great. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it was not only well done, it was 100% consistent with the experience we had at Zappo. We, I think we opened our first bank account in maybe the end of 2013, January 2014. Uh, it was already clear we were going to be able to raise about $20 million in a Series A. Uh, we raised a total of $41 million in the first six months of, of 2014. In that time, I think we had eight bank accounts closed. Um, countless others uh, just shut the door before they even would talk to us about opening an account. And in this case, I'm talking about operational bank accounts. So accounts that we needed just to pay salaries and expenses. Um, banks didn't want our business. That was a shock to me. Uh, I thought that I was the client and they were going <laughs> to be <laughs> enthusiastic about having our deposits. It's absolutely not the case. And so it's been... Um, it's been eye-opening over the past 18, 24 months to understand that it's not that kind of relationship. It's really a partnership. And um, the bank is accepting you and giving you the privilege of access to the financial services system um, on the condition that you meet certain requirements of, of compliance and licensing and the like. And it, we can go into more detail about that, but it is, um, it's been very trying. And for a company that wasn't fortunate enough to raise a lot of capital, and in many cases, I just don't see how they can do it. Yeah, I mean, so one thing that really struck me when we started talking about this was 
and Pratt, you touched about on this on your paper a little bit, that part of the reason that some banks might not bank virtual currency businesses is because they don't have a clear sense of the regulatory structure or where they fit in, and they don't maybe have the best compliance program built yet, or they don't have a good understanding of that. But Ted, I would put Zappo and your team and your commitment to compliance sort of at the top of the scale of mm -hmm. what can be expected from this industry, the experience and all the other things that your team brings to bear. So I was really surprised to hear that you even had trouble keeping bank accounts. So can you, did the banks give any reason or can you share maybe for people in the audience what you might have learned from that? Do you, looking back at that experience, do you think, oh, yeah, looking back, maybe some of that was on us? Oh, or do you just, yeah. you know, what can you share from that experience? Well, no question, some of it was on us. I, I think um, most people didn't get into the virtual currency space because they wanted to engage in compliance and, and licensing. That, um, so I think from the start, there was probably an attitude problem. I'm not saying that Zappo suffered from that, but certainly we weren't paying attention strongly enough to the type of approach and attitude that we needed to take. Um, since that time, we've come to accept. We've gone through the five stages of grief about you know, compliance and licensing and regulation, but eventually you better get there. Sooner or later, you better get there and just accept the fact that if you cannot meet certain um, minimum uh, KYC, AML, licensing requirements, you are not only going to have trouble getting a bank account, if you do get a bank account, you're going to get the bank in trouble. And if you're lucky, they'll shut your account before the whole thing falls apart. So yes, we didn't appreciate that completely when we first started, so it's kind of on us. But the other point is this. When you think about it, the virtual currency space is not that big yet. It will be. I'm 100% convinced of that. Um, but it's not yet. So a bank looks at you and says, oh, there's not that much business that's going to be coming in here, uh, and there's a ton of risk. Um, no. And you can't really blame them for that, in a way. Um, right. It's not consistent with innovation, but you can't blame them for it. Pratt, do you have anything to add based on some of the findings in the paper? Yeah, I mean, I think I think differentiation is getting better. Uh, I think blockchain in particular, uh, banks are starting to view it. Uh, you know, I, I st there's still a dearth, a lack of uh, communication within banks uh, investing in. Uh, big, um, sorry, blockchain on the one hand and not really understanding what blockchain is on the other. Um, but I think the influx of capital, sort of what Ted says, at a certain point the economics motivate the investment and banks are really seeing this now as an economic proposition. So I think there's a little bit of gravity toward that, but I think there's still a significant amount of uh, first mover advantage which is to be taken and there's a lot of engagement that still needs to be done, I think. Okay. Um, Alan, we so appreciate your willingness to come and talk in a public way today about the fact that you, in fact, bank virtual currency businesses. Um, why do you think so many banks shy away from being public about their relationships with virtual currency businesses? So I think what what Ted talked about really kind of zeroes in and, and, and hits on the answer, and that is that it's it's a small, you know, from, from the perspective of what banks are trying to do in general, put aside this industry, this is a fairly small niche. And there's a lot of potential risk uh, when our regulatory agencies that, that oversee us, when they, when they don't really understand what the risk might be, then the, the catch-all bucket is reputation risk, okay? And, and so we, we heard that early on, and then every time there was another event, we heard it again. Um, and so I think if, if banks were interested, that would initially then just kind of push them, you know, they would, they would back away from it, and then if they were going d down the path, the last thing they wanted to do was, was make a big announcement about it because everyone was going to start flooding in. And so we started very slow. We started trying to understand the industry ourselves, and it was more intellectual curiosity than anything else. And it was just, okay, this, this looks interesting, and it looks like it could have a profound impact on our industry. And so 
we should at least try to understand it a little bit. And we're, we're a relatively small bank, and as we got into it a little bit more, I started thinking this is this is actually pretty cool. Over here. And and so then we started playing with it. You know, myself and a few others at the bank started just playing with it personally, buying some Bitcoin and trying it out, etc. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we we decided, okay, well, let's see what it would take to bank one of these companies. During none of that process were we going to raise our hand and say, "Hey, we're you know we're thinking about doing this." Right. Once we got down the path a little bit, then we had to bring our board up to speed. So just as there's the external factors, there's also the internal factors. Okay, and because what our board of directors, what were they hearing in the industry? They they were hearing all the headlines, right? So so I knew that we we had to have a very well well articulated, thought out plan as to how we were going to attack this so that the board's first reaction wasn't you know well what about Silk Road what about you know Mt. Right. Gox etc so um, and then at the same time we then had to bring the regulatory agencies along and um, again this was 2013 early 14 and um, so it's just not something that that you're gonna raise your hand and talk about until you're ready and um, so I guess what I'm saying is we're ready. Okay, well, <laughs> we, um, we applaud your bravery. Well, thank you. Um, if we've all, you've all touched on this a little bit, but um, what, can we just talk a little bit about the relationship about how banks and virtual currency businesses can better understand each other? I mean, Pratt, in your paper you wrote that a consistent theme reported by virtual currency businesses is their perception that banks have been unable or unwilling to differentiate among the various types of business, virtual currency businesses. Um, along the ecosystem, or at least to the extent that they do, they don't do a very good job at it. Um, and virtual currency businesses report that banks don't really appreciate the distinctions between a standard wallet service and a multi-sig custodial structure. So given that um, you guys have seemed to successfully navigate that education of each other, what are some recommendations that you might have for people in the audience who are thinking about these issues for themselves, either as a virtual currency business, maybe there's another bank out there, maybe there are some regulators out there. What are some suggestions you have for how we can better have this dialogue? Uh, okay, so first of all, Bitcoin and virtual currencies are not easy to understand. Um, <laughs> it takes a while. So patience and open dialogue and perseverance and consistency is a prerequisite. But uh, on a more tangible level, I, I think a good idea is to approach a bank once they do understand your business and say, listen, we'll start with a limited pilot program. Um, we'll have certain limitations on how much volume there will be or maybe the size of the transactions. Let's see how it goes. Maybe we'll limit it just to wires and wires above a certain amount, which will cut down a lot on the, on the, uh, on the volume. And we'll see how that goes. We'll work with each other. Um, and then maybe we can move to ACH or other types of, of payments and we can expand the range of, of, of volume. I, I think that is probably your best bet. And it also is is good for the virtual currency company too because believe me you're going to learn along the way um, what works what doesn't work what you have to be better at so that going that route rather than looking for the big win right away is probably more realistic and do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely right. In almost every case, uh, you know, we bank about somewhere between 15 and 20 companies right now, and in, in just about every case, we've we've started slow. We've uh, we've started, you know, stepping back. Also, Ted mentioned some of the early bank accounts that they they um, unfortunately had closed were, were just operating accounts, mm -hmm. right? So so um, we make a distinction as well. Uh, um, and from our perspective, our bank, we are in the business of providing banking services to businesses. And just so happens that Bitcoin, blockchain, um, you know, you're all businesses. And so we want to provide banking services to you. So first step is, okay, let's, let's get an operating account open. Let's start to get to know each other. Let's look at, the, what, you know, if you're, a, if you're an exchange, let's, let's look at flow of funds. If you're a wallet, let's you know let, let's just let's uh, let's understand the licensing regime that's you know that might be 
required, etc. Let's walk down the path together. Pratt mentioned earlier a, a six to 12 month time frame. It does not take Silvergate Bank six to 12 months to open a bank account. However, that's not an unrealistic time frame if you if you haven't started thinking yet about licensing and some of those you know those other things so um, if you come to us with a complete package you say okay this is my business plan this is um, you know this is the licensing and then it's going to take us you know, 30 to 60 days to absorb all of that we're going to do a site visit we're going to get to know you we're going to look at everything and then you know, and then we're going to get started and um, as Ted said we will likely start start slow, but we can ramp fairly quickly if we're comfortable, and, and that's all about transparency. And one of the other things, if there's anything in the closet, anything that, you know, it, it is to our mutual benefit to get that on the table. Because chances are, if there's something in in your past, and I'm not talking about personally, okay? I'm not, <laughs> but if there, you know, if if something happened, you know, on your platform or something, chances are the regulators know about it. And if you know about it, and our regulators know about it, but we don't know about it, then we're in a very bad position because they're going to share that with us at the most inopportune time, and um, and we're going to look like a deer in the headlights, and that's that's probably not going to end well. Mm -hmm. So I think I'll stop there. Yeah. I think one other thing I would say is uh, a complaint that many banks had uh, is about shifting business plans, and and so you know it's it's totally natural for a startup company to sort of pivot with the times and be very opportunistic, but because you know the bank wants to know what your licensing regime is, when your facts that underlie the premise of your entire existence shifts, I think that, that's another tell, tell sign that, that you're going to have trouble. Is, so I think you really need to have a concrete vision and idea that you present. And, and if it does, if it is incremental, sort of as Ted said, or if, if it does pivot, you need to have a really good reason for it to pivot. And you need to have solid reasons and not just, you know, well, this helps us evade the next you know, licensing regime that's coming out, because that's going to get you in trouble too with your bank. Mm -hmm. So, um, a general question from all of you, and this is from the uh, from a regulatory perspective. So, do you think that the guidance from regulators like FinCEN's um, guidance on money service businesses, or the OCC's interpretive guidance, have been helpful? Um, or what else do you think we need in this space? And also, what do you think is realistic for us to expect? I don't know, I'm looking down the line, uh, but you can all, I mean, I'm um, curious on all perspectives. I remember back, I, I was in law school when, uh, in 93 to 96, when the internet was, was coming, um, and there was a lot of problems trying to fit in with um, IP law and fit existing sort of uh, intellectual property law, property rights and stuff into what the internet was enabling. And there was a lot of sturm and drang about that. The same thing's going on now. So we've got these existing uh, money services business laws and MTL regulations and the like, and they don't fit exactly what a lot of these businesses are doing. So I think we're just in this phase where regulators are learning and becoming more comfortable. I think that uh, the things like Mt. Gox and, and um, dark markets and stuff took people by surprise, and there was this reaction against Bitcoin and virtual currencies, and we've moved past that, I think now. Um, and people are getting more comfortable with virtual currencies in general, and I think regulation will follow. One point I do, I do think is important, you know, what we're talking about today is, is the United States. And I can tell you that virtual currency, by its very nature, if you're a virtual currency company, you're global day one. And if we don't get regulation right in this country, and it's a very complex system where you have federal agencies, multiple federal agencies, and 50 states, actually 48, 49 states with, with their own MTLs that you have to follow, if we don't get it right, people are going elsewhere. Um, you know, the, the announcement in the UK about what Circle did with Barclays and, and their e-money license, I can tell you, having spent a lot of time in Europe, that um, different countries are opening their arms very wide for blockchain companies and Bitcoin companies. And if they make it a lot, a lot easier and make regulations with a lot more sense over there, that's where the innovation will be, period. So there's a lot at stake here, much more than just like 
how does a startup get a bank account? Um, I think we're really facing uh, we're facing the issue of whether the United States will be a center of fintech innovation or whether it will be elsewhere. And I think it's an open question. Do you have anything there? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to open up the can of worms, but yeah. but uh, you know, there, there's always the talk of sort of the federal licensing regime for these uh, for these type of businesses, which is sort of ironic, you know, given the way they started, it was sort of a you know, look what we can do under you know lack of regulation. But to the extent that there is some sort of federal uh, regulatory scheme that can preempt the states, and so you have you know maximum clarity and efficiency and portability across state lines, you know, that would be a big step but maybe a more incremental near-term step is I think with you know public policy efforts like you know that what coin center is doing you know I think we could have more guidance that that is put out there there, there has been uh, you know in the recent past even post sort of operation choke point guidance which explicitly says you know banks you are not the de facto regulator for the clients that you bank um, but you have that on the same time as you have the intense regulatory pressures uh, during examination and so you have a mixed message and as a conservative institution you're always going to go with the more conservative of the two and so it's one thing to put out you know happy talk but it's another thing to then hit the banks <laughs> with uh, yeah. enforcement orders and so obviously you know I, I think there needs to be more than just happy talk you need to have some real robust sort of explicit and I think virtual currency industry based guidance and uh, you know a more positive tone I think from the regulators yeah and I think Pratt, that last point is is spot on because the what we're trying to do is and, and you all know this but we're we, you know we're, we're trying to put an entitling new new um, technology a tiny new way of doing things into an old regulatory framework right and and just like what you were talking about 20 years ago you know with the internet Ted it just it just doesn't really fit and, and, and there's going to be some pain as as we go through and get to wherever it is that, that we're going I've had the opportunity uh, to participate with the San Francisco Fed at some, in some of the the innovation stuff that that they're doing and I'll tell you most of what is on their radar it seems to me is is more on on the credit side it's more on the uh, marketplace lending and you know all that stuff and, and you see a lot of uh, talk about ways that that's going to be regulated in the CFPB is coming in now and, and all that. I don't see as much uh, on this side, and I think it. I think it's got to be um, from folks such as Coin Center and then industry that you know, because it's not going to be driven by the banks, quite quite frankly. And you know, it's it's got to be driven by industry. Right. So um, and and Silvergate will be there to help. Hear <laughs> um, <laughs> so, that? Yeah. Um, um, actually, some of this discussion leads into a couple of questions that have come from the audience. Um, one, um, I guess this is for you, Alan. Um, will traditional banking products be sufficient for virtual currencies or virtual currency businesses? Is there, or is there a need for a new type of product? So, again, just as we're dealing with with um, old regulation, trying to fit it with new technology, I'm I'm sure there's there's an answer there that's that's not dissimilar. So far, you know, what we're trying to do is is fit into our existing product offerings and now I think what's what's happening in some of the other sessions that are going on is you know with the blockchain with the, you know with the, with the development that's going on hopefully you know maybe some things are going to come out of that um, what I what I don't know yet is you know we haven't spoken with a lot of blockchain companies that are looking for bank accounts and my my perception is that perhaps because they don't have the word cryptocurrency or Bitcoin or something in their name yeah. that that it's not as big of a challenge for them I would just um, caution or you know and and maybe this cautions too too strong but just as, as Ted said they got bank accounts closed for no apparent reason um, you, you don't know when the winds are going to shift so I would I would suggest that that folks even if they're Focusing on blockchain, that they look for they look for a bank that is open to to innovation, basically. Um, and again, another question. I think it's for you, but maybe you might know. I don't know if you'll know the answer to this question. But um, did internet companies in the mid '90s face similar challenges? Are there lessons to be learned? 
from that, or is this a unique thing because of the underlying asset you know, that, that some of these companies are dealing that's with? That's a great question, and I don't know because in the 90s I was in private industry, so I was I okay. stepped out of banking, so I don't know the and answer. Maybe to that that's question. another question for Coin Center to consider in there future you know. research. Um, I'm just trying to read these questions so we can get to as many. Um, there seem to be a lot of questions in here, and we've touched on it a little bit, and it was a question that I had, so it's not particularly anybody's question. Sorry, it's kind of a hybrid. Um, but and this is not just an issue in terms of uh, in terms of virtual currency businesses being able to operate, but this is really a competitiveness issue, isn't it, for the U.S.? I mean, we have, the U.K. has said there's a race in fintech and that they intend to win it. Obviously, we have very strong regulations, and that's what makes the U.S. so attractive in so many ways. But um, do you want, does anybody care to offer some thoughts? Ted, you talked a little bit about this earlier, about that this is a competitiveness issue. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't stress it strongly enough. Yeah. Um, look, it, it, it's very hard to build any business. Everybody here knows that, I think, mm -hmm. and it, regardless of the industry you're in, um, Bitcoin is extremely difficult. It's two or three times as difficult. And if you can get into a jurisdiction in which um, even some of the regulatory burden is lightened, it's worth it. And um, I, I think the UK realizes that. I think Switzerland realizes that. I think there's other European countries that do, some in Asia. Um, I think the US is getting there. Uh, I was really encouraged by what I heard from the governor of Delaware uh, yesterday. But it's happening now. And um, it, if you can't figure out a way to make FinTech innovation um, less burdensome, it's not going to happen in your jurisdiction. I don't have anything to add. You don't have anything to add. Um, well, someone just sent in this question. How far off are we from having Bitcoin reside in a bank? Like the actual Bitcoin reside in a bank? Is that like the craziest question you've ever heard? <laughs> No, but there was uh, during one of the general sessions this morning. I think um, there, there was a prediction that said it was somewhere between two to five years, but it could be off by uh, fifty to one hundred percent. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I mean, yeah, I don't think it's I don't think it's right around the corner. Although, interestingly, in a in a Federal Reserve, um, a San Francisco Fed paper yeah. that was put out just la I think it was third or fourth quarter of last year, there was an article that that talked about this and speculated that eventually. You know, Bitcoin or virtual currency might might be on banks' balance sheets. So, uh, but so not not completely unthinkable. Yeah, but not yeah. Maybe. I, I mean, and and then obviously, I I mean, if you sat in on any of the sessions yesterday, there was talk about central banks actually issuing mm -hmm. their own forms of uh, virtual currency. So, and one thing I would say on sort of the banks holding Bitcoin in their uh, principal capacity, I suppose it, it it depends on what what was motivated by the question. But of course, you know, to have a banking charter, I think every single state you have to have FDIC and deposit insurance, and the FDIC hasn't come out and proclaimed whether this is a you know insurable form of money or it is a deposit. And so you have that issue whether it, it falls under the FDIC insurance. And so it depends. You know, is this a principal holding of the bank or are they doing it in a trust or custodial capacity? Mm -hmm. But I think the question was motivated by whether this is on their balance sheet and whether they can lend it and take it and uh, you know whether it's treated as a deposit and that I think you know a, a first threshold issue is whether that falls under the, the deposit insurance regime of the FDIC. Right. I think I would say that we need to walk before we can run and if we're still having this conversation about how Zappo can get a bank account then I think we, that's a really big question but an important one. Um, I think we're out of time. I'm not sure how much time we have left but if I would just like to thank our panelists so much for all of your thought and your insights and Pratt for your paper and all of your work on the paper. So thank you very much.